Hello, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 578, Cinco, Siete, Ocho, Con Mi, or Con Mi, or Conmigo, not Conmigo, how do you say it? Hola a todos, eso es el Agostino Zynga show, uh... Con mi, is it o con mi o para mi? No, it's not para mi, it's for me. Con mi, Agostino Zinga. Estos episodio cinco siete ocho. Hopefully that makes sense for all my Spanish speakers out there. As you can tell, I am the bilingual babe. Right, that's what they call me. Bilingual babe. Forget gringo papi, I'm bilingual papi, yeah. That sounds terrible coming out of my mouth, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I hope you're well wherever this podcast may find you. As you can tell, I'm in good spirits as per usual. I've got a whole bottle full of water. I'm all hydrated and full of green juice and eggs and all that good stuff and running and lifting weights. I feel good, man. I feel good. I'm not going to lie, I feel amazing absolutely amazing i'm actually in a really um weird little training regimen i'm doing at the moment where i'm kind of you know doing three days of cardio three days of lifting weights and some days i'm doing two a days <gasps> shock horror and you're wondering actually why are you doing all that working out for because i'm going to berlin in a few weeks and i want to be in the best shape that i can be in so i can fit into all my cool clothes and i don't have to buy new fat boy clothes that's basically it all right because since i've been there last I put on a few kilograms and now the clothes that I went there in don't fit me anymore. So I'm trying to get back into them. So when I go there, I don't have to buy new clothes because there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than putting on a few kilograms and having to buy new clothes. It's one thing putting on a bit of happy weight. It's one thing putting on a bit of weekend weight, a bit of holiday, whatever it may be. Just, you know, you're a little bit fuller in the cheeks. You're a little bit round in your old buttocks. But when you have to buy a whole new wardrobe, you're like, okay, something has to give, especially for me. Because I'm a, you know, a, um, a self-confessed fashion flipping addict. And I'm also obsessed with street wear and sneakers and stuff. And just looking good in image and design and all that sort of stuff. I recognize and see that thing for what it is. And I don't want it. So I can, I can get to that level where I put on a few more pounds. But ultimately for the long term happiness of my life, I don't want to live that reality. It's just not something that I would accept ever from myself. And obviously, the older you get, the harder it becomes to do. But I've done it plenty of times before, so I've got loads of reference points that I can kind of go back on. And when it's getting hard and I don't want to get up in the morning, I can always kind of picture how I'm going to feel when I finally do fit into that jacket. I finally do fit into those jeans. It's kind of, you know, and I'm, and I'm also pretty good at delayed gratification. I think most people who struggle with their weight probably don't f find it very difficult to find the motivation to work out, to eat well to get up in the morning, to not go out, to cut out the booze, whatever you need, to, you need to do to get where you need to get to, it's pretty difficult to do it. Especially if you don't really care too tough about clothes and stuff or about looking good. Um, because I think those things, as shallow as they are, as immaterial as they are, as surface level as they are, they do go a long way to kind of giving me the um, determination, motivation I need to get up in the morning and go to the gym, to get up again in the evening and go out for a run and to make sure I'm eating the right things, to make sure I'm hydrating myself. All those things are super important, but there has to be an in, there has to be like an internal motivation that needs to drive you. And um, nowadays it's, it's harder because there's not many demands placed on you, right? I think nowadays society kind of lets you be average. It lets you just exist the way you are and be happy and you are enough and all this kind of stuff, which is fine to a certain extent. But, you know, coming from the background that I come from in terms of playing sports all my life and also being somebody who's heavily, heavily self-critical, I just can't get down with it, man. I can't. I can't get down with it. Just accept accepting things as they are, especially if it's in your control. Obviously, I'm somebody who I try to be as, um, not realistic, but I try to be as, uh, I try to be as firm. Hmm, no, seriously, I try to have my foot in one in one foot of being realistic, and one foot in being just a dreamer and optimistic. Right, just feel, thinking big, lofty goals. But I like to have both feet in both places to keep me somewhat grounded. But it doesn't mean because I'm realistic I don't dream. It doesn't mean because I dream I don't get realistic. I let them both kind of play off each other. But overall, 
my internal drive is what really gets me up in the morning to do those kind of things because there's been plenty of times I've gone out for a run where I've legitimately thought to myself like are you really doing this for a flipping Rick Owens jacket are you really doing this for a pair of jeans or for a pair of Subi jeans are you really doing this for a flipping bomber jacket are you really doing this for a particular look that you want to go for whatever uh, JW Anderson whoever, whatever brands I've got Comme des Garçons all these brands are this what you're really doing this for you're doing all this stuff just to wear this Comme des Garçons shirt which you probably wouldn't end up wearing because I do it all the time when I go on holiday I take loads of clothes with me and end up wearing the same clothes I wear when I'm in London you know what I mean it's typical typical nonsense but I just, I don't know. I just have to do it. Have to give it a go. And again, I haven't got long. Don't get me wrong. I've only been doing it for a month. So it's not like I'm going to suddenly turn into flipping Kate Moss by the time I get there. But I just need a good base, especially if I'm going to be out there and I'm going to be getting on it and I'm going to be on the booze and I might, might be on the on the other things out there. I might be eating loads of kebabs and stuff and going to Burgermeister and eating loads of delicious Asian food. That's one thing I always forget when I do go out to Berlin is that the Asian food there is really good. Like, incredibly good maybe surprisingly so because obviously you know the the, the kind of um the majority minority that kind of gets spoke about when it comes to culinary delights is usually Turkish because obviously the Turkish food there is out of this world because I think most places in Western Europe have their version of a kebab but then when you go to Germany usually it's a whole other experience like I, I can only imagine how good the Turkish food is in actual in in Turkey if what we're getting in Berlin is is closer to what they eat back at home but even then it's still kind of put through the lens of like a european person right or like sorry like um of like a westerner kind of thing i'd love to see it but for some reason the asian food in germany i mean berlin specifically is also really good there's this park that i, w I really wanted to go to where they'd serve loads of amazing asian food i think there's like little street carts and street food markets there and stuff i, I flipping love it i really really do um Oh, what's happening here? Why have I got a message from here from PayPal? What's PayPal talking to me about? It's not good when you get these notifications because you think someone's maybe rampaging through your account. So this isn't the greatest thing to hear. But let's see what people are saying here. Uh, conversations. Get away. I don't want a conversation. Okay, cool. Ah, okay. Now it's coming into my account. I get what they're saying. It makes complete sense. But yeah, um, what's I going to say? So yeah, I want to go. I want to go over there. I want to get some food to eat. That'll be flipping brilliant. I can't wait for that. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to have a good time. I can't really wait. Like there's loads of clubs I want to visit too that I haven't had the chance to check out. One of them being RSO Club or RSO Berlin, which was former, which was formerly known as the Rivers, Rivier Sudust, which was formerly known as Griesmüller. And this was a legendary club in Berlin, like one of the best ones. It had like this real, it kind of like was a, a grown-up version of like Sissy Foss or something, right? You know, Sissy Foss is like it's a little bit of a adult playground sort of vibe, right? There's like little huts and little rooms and different venues, and everyone looks like they've been, you know, taking way too many hallucinogens. But I thought um, Grease Miller was like an adult version of it because it still had the adventure part of it, where you could go out and play on the climbing frame, you could sit in those massive drums, you could sit on the couches outdoors. I remember once actually being outside of Grease Miller one year and just sitting on the couches outside, um, bugging, absolutely my eyes rolling in the back of my skull, just like you know, off a of flipping MDMA and stuff. And this random girl just sitting next to me and we we're both buzzing. We we're just like holding hands. Nothing sexual, nothing romantic, nothing. Just kind of enjoying the moment and just talking about, you know, how we were felt, feeling and stuff for hours. I remember it. And then we just kind of left each other, shook hands and kept it moving. And, I, and I've always really appreciated that sort of stuff. I kind of, I kind of slipped up a few times here and there in terms of trying to continue the fun with people that you meet abroad, especially when I go on my little, you know, techno tourism trips. But I really do like the odd kind of like oh we're best friends like on this trip and then we don't see each other again i think there's something really magical about that um something really cool and really in the moment where you just kind of enjoy each other's company right in that instant and you don't do anything else i remember once when i went to Berghain ages ago i forgot when this was maybe a four years ago maybe i met up with some guys from the berlin social club um subreddit there's like a subreddit where if you want to go clubbing and you want to meet up with people, you don't want to go on your own. There's lots of people that kind of meet up and do that kind of stuff. Obviously, I go on my own all the time, but it was just nice to kind of mix it up one time and we met each other all inside and, you know, everyone that kind of messaged basically ended up getting indoors and it was kind of sick to kind of just have that, you know, first the first interaction you're having with someone that you don't know is in a nightclub 
but then because you're all there alone, you're kind of codependent, but you don't want to look like you're codependent. So this weird little game you're playing and then, you know, in a group of people, you'll find your core that you like, two or three, four, whatever it may be, and you just can't, you just kind of, you know, latch onto them and just you know, do your thing. And it was so good, man, honestly. I really, 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 really loved it. I'm not going to lie. That was really a good experience. So I'm really looking forward to doing that and just kind of pr go walking around. And another thing too I'm going to do, which I don't usually do when I go, I never usually upload pictures. I think the last couple of times I've been there, I've maybe uploaded a picture of myself queuing outside the Bergheim or something. Just a classic kind of picture to kind of, you know, get the timeline pumping and get some likes on my account and boost that little engagement because I hardly use my Instagram, especially the main feed. But this time around, I'm going to take my film camera because I bought some really cool Ilford film that I've been using lately, actually. Yeah, I've got one here. No, no, I don't have it here. But this is a Fuji. But I've got some really good Ilford film that I've been using with my cameras when I go out and stuff and when I go on my travel. So I'm going to take that with me too and take some really, really nice pictures. But that's kind of the vibe that I'm, I'm actually on when I go there. So there'll be a, probably a, some gallery hop in here and there. Uh, maybe I land on the weekend. I'm not sure how it's going, how it's going, to, how it's going to vibe. And then of course, loads of restaurants, loads of clubs, and then kind of enjoy myself and go from there. And I'm also doing the real grown-up thing, which I never usually do. I'm actually going to book an, a hotel because I've actually, you know, I'm okay in terms of booking a hotel now because I've saved some money. So I'm going to actually book a hotel. So that's going to be absolutely cool, in it? Um, usually I'm always staying in, you know, Airbnbs and hostels and just, you know, really kind of uh, fugging it out. But, I just can't do that vibe anymore. I'm too old for that sort of stuff. It's not usually my vibe. And I'd like to have my own space. And I also hate, one of the main things I kind of hate about Airbnbs, which is something I kind of have kept an eye on now when I book them, I always try and book with like super host or like places where you see it's like a self-checking kind of thing. The annoying thing is always the key exchange, I feel like, especially in places like Berlin. Um, you know, people are just living their lives and doing their thing and then here you come wanting to stay in their place and they have to, you know, make the adjustments to meet you and then you're not sure what time you land and what time you're going to get there. It's just annoying. Um, so it's always a bit fiddly. The recent times I've been there, there have been some good ones where they just tell you to pick up the keys at like a local um, Spetty, whatever, right? Spetty, however they call the little bodegas they have there. That's been pretty cool. But when you have to meet the person, it's just annoying. So, but then obviously on the flip side of it, um, hotels, you can only check in after 4 p.m. So if you get that early flight that I always get, that 6 a.m. flight, because you want to spend the day and use the day, you know, you don't, you don't get there and you can't really use the day because you're tired. But um, but the hotel thing might be good anyway in general because I'll be able to leave my luggage in the hotel, hopefully holding thing, come back at four when the room's ready and go for a walk, have some time something to drink, you know, take some pictures and stuff and just enjoy myself. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not going to lie because that might be my only big trip this year or trip trip. I'm thinking of going again in July, but I think that might be it. And then, of course, I've got Houghton coming up in August in terms of the festivals. And then before that, we're going to see um, Dixon play at Toft Manor. But there's not really much else going on for me in terms of trips and holidays. This has really been a, a year of like saving and really hustling and whatnot. So, yeah, let's see how that goes, man. Let's see how that goes. Actually, you know what? Let me quickly, I, I didn't even double check this, actually. What's actually happening in RSO? Because I, I really want to go to this place. So I'm, I'm sure you guys, I've mentioned already, right? RSO Berlin is it's now, you know, basically the, the formerly known Grease Mueller Club had a short time where it was called River Sudas, which I, I guess is their outdoor thing that they have going on, which is now the home to like markets and beer gardens and stuff. But now they've changed, you know, basically RSO Club is basically where all the actual club events happen. RSO Berlin, so RSO Club. Um, and I don't even know what it looks like on the inside. This is one of the benefits of going clubbing in Berlin in general. They take clubbing so seriously that most clubs don't allow you to take pictures under the premise that, you know, to protect the anonymity of the people that go inside the clubs. I would assume that probably comes from the LGBTQ queer scene more so, the whole no pictures. So people can get up to what they get up to, especially back in the day when maybe, you know, being out wasn't the most easiest thing for most guys to do or people from that scene, queer, LGBT. So if you put a stick on someone's phone and you tell people no photos allowed, people could go in there and let, let their hair down and actually be free and be themselves for once, even if it's only for a short period of time, they could have that space in that arena to do what they need to do. Obviously over time, it's now morphed into a different thing because I guess 
the more popular nightlife has become and clubbing has become people have just taken the piss when it comes to clubs in it in terms of the experience and documenting it people having a flash on all the time recording every single thing that they're doing some people even you go to clubs and they're legitimately watching the dj perform through the screen of their phone they're in the club and they're watching it through the screen of the phone instead of actually you know just recording and holding it to the side and actually enjoying the thing with your eyes they're absorbing the whole environment everything through the screen of a phone which is absolutely bizarre but people do what they want to do but that for sure does affect the vibe of the club and you only have to check out clips from like circo loco you know they have great lineups of djs again if, you, if you're not a fan of tech house it's one thing but you can't deny that there's very proficient high level very famous very well-known um industry vets kind of people on those lineups but the party just looks horrible number one is full of dudes and number two they're all holding up their phones trying to record the drop it just takes away from the event takes away from the party takes away from the vibe and there's really minimal minimal dancing the most dancing you see is people on the stage twirling their hands in the air so that's what that's one of the great things about going to berlin is that it's a real awakening it's a real refresher it's a real education in terms of like how you're meant to club how you meant to party people actually you know i'd imagine that's probably what people like david mancusa was trying to do back in the day right um what probably the early days of studio 54 must have been like arena all these places tunnel people actually go in to listen to music to dance and that's what you get when you go to these kind of places you actually get a vibe that people are actually care about the scene they care about the music they care about the dj and they want to let their hair down and have a boogie and i love it and obviously there's some places that you go to where they just got great chill out areas and just go and relax and just post up and just listen to the person play pull out your phone and just jam all the tracks that they have and you know do your whole trin stroking thing but for the most part everyone's on it like everyone's on it like everyone's going 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 so that's what something i'm really looking forward to so but then again going back to whole not pictures thing the annoying thing about it is that you have nothing you have no idea what to expect when you go into the nightclub so usually most places you know for them for the most part even if you go into a restaurant a flipping post office whatever you know what it looks like <laughs> whereas this we have no idea what it looks like on the inside zero i don't know where the booth is i don't know what color the walls are you know what i mean zero what what the toilets look like absolutely zero about the club the bar nothing so he's going to go into completely blind and see what the vibe is like. Um, but yeah, so far, you know, from what I've seen online, the lineups look pretty decent. The weekend that I'm going to be there, there's going to be a party. There's a party all over the weekend, actually, which is great because this also coincides with the same weekend that there's going to be the Sylvester um, at the flipping uh, at Bergheim, which I still don't understand. I don't understand because the Sylvester if I'm not mistaken is the New Year's Eve party they were meant to have in like 2021 but obviously the pandemic or 2020 or something right I think 22 or 21 obviously the pandemic kind of um, scuppered those plans and now they're doing it randomly in June I don't get why you're making up a New Year's Eve day on June but I guess maybe it might be because they just want to get some extra money in the tills maybe I'm not too sure but that's an interesting thing but anyway in RSO Berlin is going to be a club and event called Gegen Chaos happening there I don't really know who's playing too tough on the list here. Who do I recognize? I recognize FKA, M4A. This person I recognize primarily because of um, the radio station called Hor, H-O, whatever. Is it Hor? How do you pronounce that radio station? Which has been a real godsend, I think, for the Berlin community. As, as horrible as it must have been to live in a pandemic in a city like that, because essentially, it, you know, without clubs, what's the point of living in Berlin for the most part? Well, from my, from my POV. So you can only imagine what it's like for somebody that's actually you know an artist and trying to find their way in there and doing it or actually just moved there because they wanted to progress in their career and then suddenly you can't do the one thing that brought you there it must be horrible but i think that station hall did a really good job in terms of showcasing great local talent and i think one of the persons that kind of stood out to me was this guy fka.m4a really cool disco-y um indie dance just vibey sort of sets i really recommend checking out oh he's gonna be in london actually for the flesh queer festival that's awesome maybe i might have to pop in for that one actually but yeah that should be cool so i see a recognize name recognized on that list um again another good thing for them which they do i like about their programming a lot of the people i don't recognize i recognize this name um kissy but i don't recognize any of the other djs of course mike star too i recognize again from whore that's about it but i like the fact that they they try and book like local acts from from what it sounds like that flyer is gnarly um which is absolutely great then going out and booking the same old tired people that do all the same old raves all over europe it just gets a little bit boring after a while so that's great to see 
what else have they got there? Let me scroll down. They've got another party called X Form on the Saturday with Surgeon and Stephanie Sykes, which is going to be six. Stephanie Sykes is a UK person who I think lives over there. Um, so that should be pretty decent. And then you've got another event on the Sunday called Technozoid. Is it called Technozid? Technozid, sorry. Old School House Open Air and Techno Indoor Ray, which sounds like a pretty good deal, to be honest. And um, yeah, it should be pretty popping. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to probably pick one or the other, but I really do want to go just so I can see the inside. That's all I want to do. Interesting, you could buy tickets in advance, in it, and still get rejected. That's a thing that's harsh, though. The door entry thing in Berlin's, hot, you know, notoriously flipping harsh, hard to hard to kind of read and to kind of guess. Um, you know, we've all heard the stories of how hard it is to get into Bergheim, but sometimes clubs there will allow you to buy tickets in advance, but they will also remain. They also have the right to basically deny you on the door if they don't think your vibe is great. Do you know what I mean? Which is absolutely mad. So, um, yeah, let's see what they're going to say. Let's see what they're going to say. But I'm really eager to see what it's like on the inside. I really, really am. Let's see what the Google, they get up on here. Yeah, I have Google reviews, what they say here from what I've checked out. Because sometimes a good little hack, again, for those of you who don't, who go out a lot and you want to check out places and you want to see what they're like. Sometimes Google reviews are a good place to check out because a lot of normies live, leave reviews on here. And it's a good gauge to see where you might land because sometimes it'll be really over-enthusiastic you know reviews of five stars and then like this one super super like one star reviews about like, this is the worst place ever and then you kind of have to you know figure it out in your head as to where you land in it and i think maybe you know the 3.2 kind of illustrates that it's somewhere in the middle this person obviously the one says don't let uh do not let inside after buying tickets in advance and then refuse to refund money though they say otherwise at the door oh sick that's that that hurts Another person says, um, the pizza is super delicious. Oh, they serve food there, okay. And the staff are cool. Um, one, one hour and 30 minutes in line having tickets. This is unbelievable. So the, the wait is probably long. Everyone keeps saying that. Love it. Okay, one negative thing. You are not allowed to bring in food and there is nothing proper to buy inside either. Okay, cool. Because from, from what I know about Berghain, which I haven't done myself, but you can bring in food. Like people bring in Tupperwares and stuff. But usually whenever I've got hungry, I've just popped out and nipped over to the little place that serves curry warts and stuff with chips and shit and got something there. That's been usually my go-to. But I've heard people bring in burgers and whatnot and peanuts and bananas and sandwiches. Um, another one says peak berlin techno in an industrial space another one says big club good sound system a lot of different details that make you have, that make that make you have a great and safe party they sell closed bottle water toilet availability is good oh okay cool because i guess in some clubs they don't let you they don't they don't give you a bottle of water closed they always take the lid off the idea around that is probably so you don't chuck the lid at people right is that ring I don't really know what the idea, or, or maybe it makes you buy more water because you can't hold it forever. You have to drink it. Maybe, I don't know, but that's a re but it's good to see that they sell you closed ones, two scenes, so two rooms and plus one outdoor, a lot of space to chill. Cool. So it sounds like a very roomy place to go. They throw me out for no reason after standing in the queue for two hours with tickets already bought. I thought, I thought Berlin was really racism. This I don't believe. People always say stuff like this. I was just in the queue standing and they just chucked me out. So they, they just pointed you out and said, you go. There's probably more contexts that we don't know about, but uh, big up Julio Nunes um, nonetheless. Well, a lot of people seem to agree with this person. Seven upvotes in that comment. So maybe this is a thing that they do a lot there in the queue. It's not really too sure. Another one says, we got tickets to advance. We're standing in the queue by 11 and 4, and we are still not close to getting in. Super bad organization. Stay away if you can. Okay. So it looks like a place you have to go either really early or really late if you want to get in because it looks like a busy place and everyone goes and then it gets oversubscribed and then they end up doing what most clubs do and not really managing the situation after the fact but yeah i'm looking forward to it regardless i'm looking forward to it moving on this is news courtesy of ra featuring the one and only lakuti who i've seen plenty of times play at berghain sorry play at panorama bar specifically one of my favorite djs to play at panorama bar and i'm actually surprised that she isn't a resident already but it's good to hear here that lakuti has been named one of panorama bar's newest residents absolute boss one of my favorite djs up there of course, you know, Panorama Bar is one of my favorite rooms anyway, especially in Berlin, because, you know, that place is known for flipping techno only. So to go up into that room and to be just blasted with great 
house music, dance music, electro, disco, indie dance, Itello, disco, like all that stuff. It's really cool. It's really refreshing. Um, everyone's vibe is really jovial. Usually the fashion's a bit different from downstairs, a lot more colour upstairs. Do you know what I mean? Like a bit more um diversity, dare I say. All those things kind of play into it. And from the times that I've been there in Panama Bar, some of my favourite times of someone playing have been when I've seen um Andy Baukama. Is that how you pronounce his name? Andy Baukama. He's been one of my favourites up there. Ryan Elliott's been really good. And also Lakuti too. Those are usually my go to's when I'm up there. And then of course there's someone like a sound stream or whatnot's up there too. That's always something that I'm always down for. Um this is courtesy of RA. This is announced in the news via Instagram post. May 18th, uh, the Uzuri Records label boss said her bookings will now be handled by Berghans in-house agency, Oscott Bookings. Imagine how cool that must be to put that in your bio, man. Oscott Bookings. That's who you have to contact to get me booked up. And I would love to know how much bookings increase as soon as you get announced as a resident. Because I'd, I'd imagine just being associated with Berghain and Panorama Bar as long as Lakuti has is enough to get you a lot of gigs anyway. And then, of course, your talent and your ability to play music and your ear and your taste level and your technique and your style and whatnot and your swagger is obviously going to get you a long way. But I would love to know, once it becomes official and it goes out as like a press release and people get sent promo clips and you're putting on your Instagram and you change your bio, I wonder if it just goes, Choom! it just sparks up. It has to, isn't it? If people are getting increases in their bookings based on appearing on boy room and stuff like that then I'd, I'd imagine being represented by one of the you know best clubs in the world is definitely going to be uh, a good thing for your career you would imagine right um let's let, let's actually go to the poster because i thought the poster is super 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 sweet uh, let me see the review on instagram myself and read it and i'll show you what she said i thought this is a really 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 sweet post so it's here so this is um, from Lakuti underscore on Instagram. It says the following. Happy to announce that I have now been given the opportunity to become an official Panorama Bar resident. Thank you for all the incredible support that people have shown me and my endeavours over the years. I owe every achievement to that support. I come from a poor working class family in Soweto. I am grateful to my mother for encouraging me and believing in myself and that I can achieve anything and everything that I set my mind to and that I am just as worthy as everyone else. This encouragement has been my philosophy throughout the years. I hope this achievement encourages kids in Soweto and every other town township kids in brazil detroit and beyond that their contribution matters and they have something to offer absolutely beautiful isn't it to say something like that man so true and you know what i'm not one for representation matters and all that sort of stuff and diversity quotas i think those stuff things like that can be really destructive and counterintuitive um but sometimes it is important to see somebody that looks like yourself you know reflected in these kind of spaces especially when you're a real fan and you want to get involved like i do and i'm djing on my really slow level that i'm at but i'm kind of aiming to get to the top and be able to play in these kind of spaces it's good to know that it's possible to see someone like yourself reflected in there because it kind of gives you it'll give you that drive and that determination to keep on going on it doesn't mean you're going to get there and achieve it but that motivation really does go a long way and you don't know what that does you don't know what you you just being you how that can touch and affect people who you don't even know from far flung places in the world who maybe never considered a career in music and maybe see you maybe not even being a dj maybe they just see you and think rah okay cool i'd love to represent someone like that i'd love to maybe set up a space where someone could play that looks like that all these kind of things come up from just seeing you you know and then with the juxtaposition of this like you know hallowed places Berghain and you know their their booking uh, agency and stuff it continues it says i also uh, so i said i hope this also encourages black women in their 40s and beyond that they they too matter and their creativity is an asset great imagine being made a resident dj at panorama bar in your 40s bruv that is real real swaggy and real amazing something for to definitely put on your flipping cv like yeah you know i mean like imagine that that's amazing i hope to see more people like myself a black queer african woman in her 40s being given these opportunities the club's affiliated agency at oscar will now be handling my bookings you can reach out to lucy at oscar.d for bookings i'll be playing this saturday at panorama bar come celebrate with me amazing man imagine how cool that vibe is going to be the first set where you become resident at panorama bar playing alongside seal 
big up who i follow on twitter she's a really good follower i recommend you check her out fauzia lakuti marie Mal mallory roman flugel ryan elliott another of my, my favorites and another new resident also added called sedef adasi absolutely bang no sedef adasi isn't a resident it's natty sears but sedef adasi is also good people recommend and tell that she's also amazing so big up lakuti really amazing achievement um Obviously, the times are there. Lukuti is playing from 8 p.m. on a Sunday at Panorama. So if you're around there, obviously check it out. It's going to be an absolute barnstormer. The main Berkheim room is, oh, no, no, Norman Nodge and Terence Fixham are playing at the same time. And Face Fatal closing Berkheim. The programming there is fucking good, isn't it? Really good. God damn. But anyway, uh, big up Lukuti. Big up Lukuti. And um, I really do hope that, that that's become like a norm and we do see a few more different flavors in Berkeley in terms of resident DJs because I think that's important too. And for myself, that gives me all the motivation and encouragement that I need to continue plowing and recording my little pirate sets and uploading them into SoundCloud for 10 people to listen to. But still, I love this game and I'll soon be there too. I love this game. Next on the list, we have news courtesy of my favorite club in London, in the UK actually, Fold have launched a pretty decent club night that I'm surprised it didn't do sooner, but I also think will serve as an interesting um, option out there in our clubbing landscape. And it is as follows. This is taken from the Instagram account and it reads the caption as follows. Um, our resident artists are more than our family. They are our voice. The voice that um, audiences hear across the planet and associate with Fold. They convey our ethos on and off the dance floor, both here in London and further afar. Our new residence night, Resistance, I love the name, will platform their voices, their sounds and their ideas. The first edition will showcase the majority of our residents. Then all future editions will be curated by different residents each time, which is a clever, clever idea. So, which is kind of similar to what Berkheim does anyway with their residents, right? In some way, but of course they don't give them the opportunity to program it, but they'll have a residence night kind of, and then they'll also have nights that are kind of programmed by residents who maybe bring people in, or if they've got their own label, they might bring some of their label artists involved. They kind of mix it up that way. But I do like, this option that they're serving up i'd imagine a lot of it maybe have to do with what's happening with the pandemic it's a new world now so maybe getting big people in all the time and filling out visas and stuff is not as easy as it once was i'm even just the other day who's the who couldn't play um what's his face um oh what's his name um, etap kyle couldn't come to the uk i think he was actually meant to play in fold actually um this past weekend but he couldn't come because you know he couldn't get his visa sorted out so i'd imagine in terms of operations behind the scenes getting people to come and play isn't as easy as it once was especially in a post-brexit world too so if you're fold and you've got a legit good core audience of people who love the club it's turned into a little bit of a hipster thing to be part of fold and to go to unfold and stuff and all this stuff and hang around there and wear the bag and wear the merch which is cool but you know it's getting it's getting a bit hipster but i get it but it still means that they have real fans fans that love it like myself who just go blind i'll just go on a random day just because i want to go party and have a good time and and get on it and i'll just go i don't care who's playing and i'm sure some people do the same thing um so that's obviously good and then they have the other thing which i think is really clever they have that unfold night on sundays which is one of the only sunday day party going into night that we have in london that's any decent and they have them you know whenever they put put them on i think it's what happening this sunday and usually those unfold nights are nights that they just promote like locals and friends and people associated with the club and they don't you know announce the lineup beforehand it's just go there you pay 10 pounds they play music during the day all the way up until like 1 a.m i think or 12 and then you head on out but from what i've heard again i haven't been there because you know unfortunately all the jobs i've had and my lifestyle and stuff just doesn't permit me to go out on a sunday especially the way that i like to go out because i don't want it to roll onto the monday but from what i've heard it's a really good vibe so i can envisage i can envision a a future where they maybe use unfold as a place to kind of test people or t as, as a as a testing proving ground quote unquote let people kind of you know um, play to a crowd get their chops smarten up their you know sharpen up their skills whatever it may be then if there's a right fit you can then put them on the resistance night instead of chucking them, you know, in the deep end with like a big label night or like a big DJ guest kind of person that's not needed and then build them up that way. So it can go back to the old days of actually having resident DJs. That's how resident DJs will actually 
developed it's kind of like an a and r type thing you you developed resident djs through that way by having them play like maybe a dead night in the week maybe it was like a thursday or a wednesday in your club you let them play those nights those nights become pretty popular people start to maybe come to those because they want to hear those people play you then maybe start inserting them in some of the other peak nights around the week blah 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 and then slowly but surely they then come to a point where they become the headliner themselves but for whatever reason in the uk that hasn't really been a thing for a long time it was always about inviting guests and it feels like because of just the circumstances of the world again in the post-pandemic world people are now more um willing to give resident djs local djs a chance to play and i always advocate for that because for myself selfishly i didn't see a pathway through to get to those places to play because unless you're somebody that produced unless you're somebody that's co-signed unless you're somebody that's part of a collective or you work in a record store it's really difficult to go and play those places as like a normal punter like myself who's a fan and loves the music and has been playing in my own capacity for 10 years it's hard to find a way in but if they have this kind of residence program it kind of gives me an idea okay cool this is a pathway to kind of go in there and i'm sure for other people it's the same thing too they see it like all right cool if i maybe get myself on unfold um if i maybe go through there maybe it can you know get me to a point where people recognize me and see what i play like what i do and then that might serve as a pathway to get on resistance that might serve others to go there do you know what i mean there's a thing there and then it wouldn't surprise me also later on if they end up becoming having their own in-house booking agency, similar to what Possession did recently, right? They've got their own booking agency as well, where they had their own people who play that hard dance, hard trance, whatever hardcore music they play. And it's all come because of, you know, them promoting their own people and they put their events on, um, you know, to supplement the big deals they played. So I, th I think it's a really good idea. Anyway, it continues. Um, each resident will have the complete control of the lineups, culminating in a night that reflects their individual sound. Resistance number one, which I'll be at because I always like to go to the first one. I was at the first dance in 2018. I'm I'm going to go to this one too and um, we'll be on saturday the 25th of june you can get your tickets in the description i think i guess or on the website the photos are by a person called who's that what's their name the, the, the pictures are really nice i gotta be honest the pictures are really really nice come on you're gonna show me the thing oh this is my uh, the, the the photographer's name is evac e evac salvi evac salvi um so yeah there's pictures of the resident djs here uh you've got voice drone you've got a person called anna annabelle who is it is that anna annabella arayo uh you've got a person called james newmarch you've got a person called albert haidari you've got a person called gareth wild uh another person who i skipped there called uh andromeda another person there called seven x zines i don't know how you pronounce that um and another person who looks absolutely amazing called Lockhearts. the only thing i'd say and again the pictures are awesome the only thing i say is kind of white in it it's really 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 white <laughs> that's the only thing i'd say which doesn't really represent the club really because again i've been there a lot of times and i think other people who've kind of watched my channel also have been there themselves the club is really cool like that because it kind of covers a whole range of people especially in london it kind of is a good sort of melting pot i think for the different sort of vibes of people that go there you know the other time i went to go see flipping christian ab play and i was really surprised to see that amount of black people in fold because obviously christian ab being a black dj himself and also that sound tech house kind of tip you know maybe attracts that kind of uh crowd and they were all there in fold so it clearly has the appeal to be able to you know pull in people from the what i would deem to be the alternative kind of nightlife scene in terms of lgbtq plus um, raves or the kind of kink parties and then also kind of pulling in typical tech housey type people and you know melodic house and deep house type people so it would be nice to see different residents here that maybe kind of speak to the um the vast array of colors and shades and color races and creeds and stuff involved there or maybe it's not such a big deal i don't really know but that's one thing i just point i just kind of saw you know what i mean it's just it is kind of white but the pictures are really nice um i'm sure it's gonna be a great event i'm looking forward to it 25th of june happening soon actually let me continue here and make sure i do this make sure i go here And then next on here, we have this pretty crazy, yeah, we have this pretty crazy article courtesy of Business Insider. It looks like Elon Musk has got himself in a bit of bother, man, a bit of bother. According to Insider, Business Insider that is, 
A SpaceX flight attendant said Elon Musk exposed himself and propositioned her for sex. Documents show the company paid her 250000 for her silence. I'm really, I'm really puzzled by this whole, I got paid for my silence, but let me tell my story thing. What happens with that in the US? If you sign an ND, I'm assuming you sign an NDA, right? You have to, to get the money. Like if this happened and somebody pays you off, doesn't that void the money you get? You Or can, or can you fight it? Can, like, yeah, that's what I would say. If you sign an NDA and you accept some money, some hush money, basically, but then you go on to speak, does that mean you have to give the money back? Or, or is that like a double dip method? Like if you're a victim and you, you someone bought your silence, but then later on you're like, you know what, I changed my mind. That was too much of a traumatic experience. And I don't think 250000 actually is enough compensation to make me feel all right with it. So you're like, fuck it. You break your NDA. You speak again in the hopes that you can double dip because you already spent that 250 anyway. And then when you go, take them to court again, they're probably going to settle for way more than 250 because they just, just want to quote unquote shut you up and move on. Maybe. But then again, if you're Elon Musk and you didn't do it, this is some really interesting timing considering what's going on with Twitter, considering how he's mentioned the other day that he, you know, never votes Republican, but he's actually going to vote Republican and new in, 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 the, in the coming elections and stuff. And just in general, it seems like his public reputation in the US isn't the greatest. People really don't like him that much um, for whatever reason, maybe because he's trolling and he's shit posting, maybe because of his views, maybe people still holding that um, that thing with the, what was that, that diver? Remember that diver when those kids got trapped? Did someone got trapped in some tunnel and he called one of the guys a pedo or something? People didn't like that, but yeah, some really interesting things. So this story comes to his insider. If it says as follows. SpaceX, the aerospace firm founded by Elon Musk and the world's wealthiest man, paid a flight attendant 250000 to settle a sexual misconduct claim against Musk in 2018. He's so horny. The attendant worked as a member of the cabin crew in a contract basis for a SpaceX corporate jet fleet. Okay, so I was wondering, where, where are their flight attendants from SpaceX? But I guess to ferry the people who work for SpaceX back and forth. That's interesting too, because Elon Musk doesn't, doesn't travel on normal planes. He only travels private. There's someone on Twitter who has like a tracker that tracks every flight he takes and stuff, um, which he obviously isn't pleased about. But I guess it's like public, it's publicly available information because I guess you have to be in the in the skies and whatnot. I don't know how that works, but yeah. Um, anyway, it continues. She accused Musk of exposing his erect penis to her, <laughs> rubbing her leg with Akerson and offering to buy her a horse in exchange for an erotic massage, according to interviews and documents obtained by the insider. Yo. That's a very specific allegation to say to somebody. So I'm leaning on believing this probably did happen. To say somebody showed you their erect penis, rubbed your leg without consent, and then told you they were going to buy your horse. It's like, what? Because I'm assuming this lady must have been into horses and mentioned something before. It's like, yeah, look, you remember you said that horse you said, right? Yeah, I'll get it for you, babes. Just let me touch your leg one more time. Yikes. The incident, which took place in 2016, is alleged in a declaration signed by a friend of the attendant and prepared in support of her claim. The details in the story are drawn from the declaration as well as the other documents, including email correspondence and other records shared by insider by the friend. According, oh, so the friend's the one who was exposing to. Oh, it's good. Um, good way to kind of take away you take yourself away from it according to the declaration the attendant confided to the friend that after taking the flight attendant job she was encouraged to get licensed as a masseuse <laughs> what is with these guys and getting massages what is with these creeper guys again i'm not saying elon musk is one but people in general who get accused of what they get accused of what's with the massage is a massage like a cheat way to get somebody to touch you so that you can go and do the thing that you actually want to do or do they really get off on massages? Like, that's their thing. Because if it's, if it's your thing, just do what Robert Kraft did and allegedly did and just buy a whole place and go in through the back door and have, you know, loads of lovely Asian ladies like masseuse you until you're flipping, you know, until you're covered in jizz. Like, why not? Do that, innit? Why are you going and harassing people who are just trying to do their jobs? That's what I don't understand. There's professionals out there who legitimately do this as an occupation who will be glad, gladly give you a happy ending and then here you are harassing flight attendants weird it was um during one massage in a private cabin on musk's golf stream g50 er they even got the, the flipping code for it she told the friend that musk propositioned her after insider contacted musk for comment he emailed back to ask for more time to respond and said there's a lot more to his story so he, he didn't actually do it he just asked her hey would you mind jacking me off is that what they're saying? If I were inclined to engage in sexual harassment, this is unlikely to be the first time in my entire 30-year career that it comes to light, he wrote. 
calling the story a politically motivated hit piece. You can't blame him though because the timing of this is eerie. Elon Musk has been around for ages. People have hated Elon Musk for a while. His public reputation hasn't been the greatest for a long time. There's a group of people out there who are really Elon Musk sycophants and they love everything that he does and they excuse everything that he does and they suck him up in public and they pretend they know him and they're, they're his reply guys. And there's a whole subsect of people on the internet who make it their mission to prove that he's actually dumb. That's a really strange one. There's a lot of them on Twitter. Like, oh, this guy is so dumb. He's not as smart as he says he is. It's like, mm, I don't know about that. That's a weird thing. To, he might be annoying, but to call him dumb is a bit of a stretch. Maybe dumb in some things, but overall, you know, he's probably smarter than your average. But um, you have to say that if that's true, if what I said is true about him not being liked, it would be weird that this would be the first time someone would try and bury him with a sexual misconduct allegation or sexual assault, whatever it may be, right? Because there's plenty of time to do it beforehand. Why would you wait now? Do you know what I mean? Maybe it, it hits different now because he's trying to buy Twitter and his exposure has never been greater. But, you know, this has always been a very famous dude. You know, like this could have been something that... Imagine if they would have done this straight after he went on flipping Rogan and smoked weed or, tr you know, ba barely inhaled. Imagine what that would have been like. Insider extended the deadline and, and, re uh, and reiterated the offer to Musk to comment on the claims he did not respond. Uh, reached via cell phone SpaceX Vice President and Legal Christopher Kardishi said I'm not going to comment on any settlement arrangements SpaceX did not respond to the request to comment on this media allegations that Musk offered their horse in exchange for an erotic massage <laughs> flight attendant told her friend that the billionaire SpaceX and Tesla founder asked her to come to his room during a flight in late 2016 for a full body massage the declaration says when she arrived the attendant found that Musk was completely naked <laughs> Uh, honestly these guys are massages and being naked absolutely psychos except for a sheet covering the ta lower half of his body during the massage the decoration says musk exposed his genitalia then touched her and offered to buy her a horse if she would do more referring to the performance of sex acts the attendant who rides horses okay there you go declined and continued with the massage without engaging in any sexual conduct the attendant is not for sale the friend's declaration said she's not going to perform sexual favors the incident occurred during a flight to london okay so she continued doing her job then when she stopped when when it finished she then reported him i guess in an interview with insider the friend de described the attendant's allegation in more detail she spoke on the conditions of anonymity citing fears of personal safety but insider is aware of her identity insider is also aware of the flight attendant's identity but is not naming her her because she is claimed to be the victim of sexual misconduct she declined to come in for this story so why is a friend coming forward then but oh, okay I, I think this is more so to kind of you know make sure no one's blamed so a friend who wasn't assaulted is now coming forward with the story interesting isn't it maybe they may, maybe they're both hmm, i don't know interesting isn't it? maybe they both want to get a payday who knows um he whipped out his penis it was erect the friend said and he started propositioning her like he touched her thigh and told her he would buy her a horse and he basically tried to bribe her to perform some sexual act. Okay. Look, man. Who knows what happened? Did it happen? Did it not? I'm not too sure. Um, according to Elon Musk's Twitter account, he seems to argue that it's not such a thing. Let's actually go to his replies and things and see what he's been saying because he's been tweeting a bunch about everything that's been going on. And basically reiterating that it is not true. Um, what it says here, uh, Elon, business side of Elon Gage, someone said here, generated interactions with both fans and character detractors of Elon Musk. Detractors want to destroy him. Bots and fake accounts play a role in Elon Musk's character assassination attempt. Here's what happened. Okay, this is a tie-in with the whole like bots are, you know, rampant on Twitter thing. Cool. Someone said here, David Day Dale said it would be amazing if accounts had flags that they knew had unconfirmed email addresses or phone numbers, etc. I don't want to mute them. I just want the idea of how likely it is that they're human. They will. Okay, cool. So that's what it's going to be doing going forward. Important if you want to reduce bots and spam. Uh, okay. Da -da. Another one says, uh, no, nope, we don't care about that one. Yeah, um, Elon Gate, cool. That's the, that's a pretty good name for the whole scandal going on. Let me see what someone's just saying here. Come on. Ba, 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 ba. Okay, statement from him. Uh, Sussman, I guess, about the allegations. Uh, talking about Clinton's lawyer. Some what he said something recently about something. He commented and said basically. This isn't true. What did he say?
why is it not loading here for me okay maybe i have to go back up let's see maybe if i go back up it will show it but i'm pretty sure he made some comment about it in general that i thought was fairly interesting what did he say or did, or did he delete to it? i don't think so let's see it continues on uh, come on let's go uh, 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 uh. Was it a party more moderate on all issues than reps and them would be ideal? He said, this is what most people in America want, but unfortunately, it's not realistic. Generally, the party with less power, currently Republicans at national level, moves more forward, more towards center to win moderate votes. So control of the House and Senate goes back and forth over time. Um, he says here, in the past, I voted Democrat because they were mostly the kindest party, but they have become the party of division and hate. So I can no longer support them and will vote Republican. So he says it, you know, with his chest. Now watch their dirty tricks campaign against me unfold. Judging by the relentless hate stream from the left, this tweet was spot on. Okay, cool. So I guess him coming out and saying he's going to vote is obviously affecting him. Maybe he deleted that tweet that I'm looking for, actually. Maybe he might have deleted it. But regardless, he was saying it was, a, it was all part of an attack against him because he's trying to buy Twitter. It was politically motivated. There's no credence to it. It's more to the story. And then he said something like, oh, um, Whoever was the victim, I want them to come out and say something about my genitalia. Like, is there scarring? Is there something like out? You know, there has to be proof. Like, you have to come out and say something, some proof. If not, you're just talking or something like that, innit? Which is weird. Because what does it mean? He's going to put a picture out of his flipping dick to show people that, you know, it wasn't him or something. That's going to be wild if that happens. And I wouldn't be surprised if he if he did do such a thing. This is Elon Musk at the end of the day, innit? <laughs> oh, God. Talking about other public figures who people seem to hate, to love. Jordan Peterson, my guy, Jordan Peterson, a person who I went to go see lecture once when he was first kind of coming to prominence. I bought the, um, what's, what's that thing called? What's that fucking book called? Uh, 12 Rules for Life. I bought that. That was really informative. I thought a really refreshing read. I thought in general, his, you know, opinions and thoughts and ideas around culture, around, uh, you know, family around religion, around personal responsibility. It was super interesting. I didn't really care about the culture war stuff. I kind of kept away from that, but just stuff about equipping young men, especially um, with the tools necessary to navigate life and to be the best friend, husband, role model, brother, whatever it may be, was really, really, I think, beneficial. But then for whatever reason, he's gone off the deep end. Maybe it's to do with his you know, health struggles that he's had. Um, he went through some really really terrible benzo issues and whatnot but he hasn't come out of it from the other side the same person clearly not there's clearly something you know has changed with him over the years but one thing that hasn't changed that's always been something that's kind of been his achilles heel has been his addiction to social media and i think he's admitted it on the on various appearances on joe rogan in a kind of roundabout way because joe rogan's also on the opposite side of things where he basically says he doesn't check social media at all he just posts and ghosts which makes sense considering the level of fame that he has and the amount of followers he has and the amount of people who want to interact with him probably a lot you know in general day to day you don't need that many people online as well kind of giving you their thoughts and opinions and also in order to formulate your own ideas you kind of need to just not listen to what everyone else says so that makes sense but for every reason for whatever reason, Jordan Peterson just can't let go of Twitter. He's on that bitch all the time. And he seems to jump in and he seems to do this thing that I really get annoyed by, where he seems to kind of purposely goad people into a reaction. Like he'll jump into a really hot, bu hot button topic and say something very stern, very like, here's my line in the sand, which is clearly going to um, elicit a reaction, especially for the people on the hardcore left, you would say, right? And they're going to go after him and attack him because they hate him and they think he's a reincarnation of Mussolini. And then he'll get really annoyed and start crying online about how people are vicious and they're bullying him and all this sort of stuff and the attacks and stuff. It's like, no, you know what the deal is. You know what the climate is. You know what you're, you're working with. Just keep it moving. And he wouldn't. He just kept on doing this. Sort of thing. And recently he did it again when he shared his opinion that no one asked for about a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model who happened to be a little bit, you know, a little bit on the plus model size, but it's standard protocol with most magazines nowadays. They do go out of their way to try and be representative of, you know, the population at large. And they do go out of their way to try and maybe rewrite some social norms or whatnot around what beauty is and all that stuff, whatever, you know what I mean. It's not a big deal to see like a big person on the magazine cover as it was maybe a few years ago. And it's not something to really kind of, you know, get online and start 
having arguments with people about back and forth. It doesn't really matter to, to some certain extent. But for a reason, Joe Peterson got himself involved to the point where he got attacked to the point where now he's deciding to quit you quit Twitter in general and take a break from it, which I think is only beneficial, but it might be too late from now. This is Kershaw Daily Mail. It says anti-work Canadian psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson quits Twitter after being bombarded with a vicious flood of insults for saying plus size sports trade model Yumi Nu is not beautiful. And again, he wasn't tagged in it. He's got nothing to do with the sports trade trade thing. He just gets involved, then starts crying. People attack him. Nonsense stuff, man. Controversial Canadian da, 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 has quit Twitter after coming um, under furious fire for saying that a plus size Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover model is not beautiful. Peterson59, who is famous for his stances against political correctness and woke ideologies, shared his views on the magazine's latest cover star, Yumi New, on Twitter on Monday, posting a a image of the 25 year old curvy model shoot while writing sorry not beautiful right just unnecessary just being mean for the sake of being mean we don't need to hear it from especially not from him too you've already earned your flipping outrage bucks already let somebody else who's new in the game you know do it and kind of get their little rocks off and become viral you don't need this sort of like hate it doesn't or attention it's just i don't know i don't know what's wrong with the guy within seconds of posting this tweet peterson a clinical psychologist who should know better an author and a former professor at the university of toronto was met with a flurry of criticism from other users many of whom began taking aim at his own appearance true well others labeled him a ass and a freak crazy insults um obviously this is the tweet itself they post the image of the cover star. There's a lady looking voluptuous and whatnot in the bikini. Even if you don't like it, it's not that worth getting involved in. You just scroll and keep it moving. He decided to put a quote marks underneath it with the image there and say, sorry, dot, for, not beautiful, dot, no amount of authoritarian tolerance is going to change that. Authoritarian tolerance. No one is telling you to, to flip in lick her toes, mate. It's just a magazine cover. Relax. Um, obviously, there she is posing in the thing, looking good, I think. It says here, continues. And someone says, I guess in the comments, my guy, you look like a child's skeleton cover in covered in mayonnaise with dry with dry lint on the top. You're in no position to be assessing anybody's beauty, you rickety junkie. One person fired back at Pearson, who is the author of the international best-selling book Top Rules for Life. <laughs> they call him a rickety, a rickety flipping um, what is it? A rickety junkie who looks like a child's skeleton covered in mayonnaise with dry and lint on the top. <laughs> Such a specific read. Others flipped the script by copying words from the psychologist's tweet and uh, repurposing them for him. Initially, Peterson stuck to his guns, firing back at pan uh, Pandora's and insisting that the decision to feature a plus-size woman on the cover of Sports Trade swimsuit was a conscious and cynical manipulation by a oh-so-virtuous, politically correct uh, people, I guess. But who cares if it was, man, really? It's not, it's not big bother. Anyway, it continues. In another tweet, he added, it's a conscious progressive attempt to manipulate and retool the notion of beauty, relying on the idiot physiology, uh, uh, philosophy, sorry, that such preferences are learned and properly changed by those who know better. This isn't really an issue that men should be involved in. There's a larger thing to be said about how dangerous and toxic the beauty standards are, especially nowadays, because most of the people who are in power positions who really influence culture, one of them being the Kardashians, are really the ones who are at fault for this kind of warped sense of self-worth that women seem to have nowadays, and um, especially young girls growing up where they think they are not beautiful enough just the way that they are born and they need to have this done, that done, that done. And most of it comes from obviously see the beauty industry the fashion industry but a lot of it does come from these influencers these people in media these people in culture like the kardashians who perpetuate this image of what a beautiful woman's meant to look like and then all these other girls around the world who maybe aren't blessed um genetically as much as they are or don't have conventional western beauty genes in them that maybe would make them appealing are now kind of scrap you know struggling to feel good about themselves it's already difficult and again most of it is a, is a woman issue it's a woman on woman thing but it's not nothing i should be involved in and get him poking my nose into and it's definitely not something that somebody who's unsourceless who's lacking in sources jordan peterson should be getting involved in you know I mean just allow it man it's nothing to just let them let the women do their thing in it um it continues here 
However, after he continued to be bombarded with what he described as a vicious flood of insults, Peterson called it quits, announcing that he was departing Twitter while branding a social media platform in in intrinsically and dangerously insane. But you're insane as well for your being on there, brother. And also, if I'm not mistaken, when he announced it, he ended up going on a tweet rant of like 30 or some tweets in like six hours, just firing him off. So he clearly wasn't leaving. Uh, but now I think, uh, the last time I checked, it clearly looks like he's gone through and deleted all of his tweets and they're now using his Twitter account as just like a place to just repost stuff about his book, post announcements about his lectures and stuff. It's turned into like a brand thing, which is, I think, probably beneficial for him in general and, you know, his mental health and whatnot. It continues here, it says, um, the endless flood of vicious insults is really not something that can be experienced anywhere else, he wrote. I like to follow the people I know that I think the incentive structure, the incentive structure of the platform makes it intrinsically and dangerously insane. He continued, so I told my staff to change my password to keep me from temptation and I'm departing once again. Whenever someone says that, I'm deleting the app, I'm changing my password, that just shows somebody that's lacking in any, 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 any ability to be, um, what's that word called? to have any self-discipline, to have any willpower, you're lacking it, which means you're also going to break it fairly soon. And, you know, obviously he did, he went on the 30 tweet rant after the fact. If I have something to say, I'll write an article or make a video. If the issue is not important enough to justify that, then perhaps it would be best just to let it go. Yes, please, Jordan. Yes, please. Despite his insistence that he was departing Twitter, Peterson's account remains active and he continued to tweet even after claiming that he was ex editing the, the social media site. However, he hinted that he will take he will take the, his opinions elsewhere in the near future, writing, okay, I plan to write an article on the technical reasons that Twitter is maddening. Nah, don't now start talking about why Twitter's broken, mate. You're broken too for being on there. We're all broken. Just enjoy the memes and laugh at what you need to laugh at or just keep it moving. I plan to write an article on the technical reasons Twitter is Twitter, sorry, is maddening um, us all very soon. Bye for now. Pearson proposed departure from Twitter comes just weeks after he quit the platform for the first time. He explained that he felt genuine relief during the three weeks that he spent away from social media site, <laughs> and that he believes his life got worse against uh, or, uh, against almost instantly following his decision to rejoin. This is really interesting because he's an incredibly intelligent person. He probably has a very, very high IQ, clearly somebody who thinks very deeply about things. I think he's an excellent writer, a great orator, even though he's got that really funny Kermit the Frog voice. Clearly somebody who people should be listening to and paying attention to. But on the same token, he's also weirdly addicted to Twitter, like in a really insane way, to the point where he's being rattled online by people because of things that he's tried to rattle people about and then he's trying to play victim. The same thing that he kind of goes at the left for and calls them snowflakes is what he's basically doing. He's being a snowflake. And it's crazy to see because, you know, very accomplished person, someone very smart, you imagine they would know better. But, you know, social media addiction knows no color, creed, age, race, level of intelligence, wealth. It doesn't know anything. If it gets you, it gets you like in a big way and Jordan Peterson got got by flipping Twitter boy so let's see how long it keeps it up he's saying he's gonna stop it and not be on there for a while but I doubt it moving on we have news courtesy of a Twitter account called Clayton Chambers who featured none other than my favorite Instagram platform in the world one of the most um, original and thought-provoking Instagram platforms in the world of streetwear, hidden.ny, right? The best Instagram platform out there. If you really want to get your info on what's hot out there, if you really want to get a taste on what's cool, if you really want to get an insight into what to wear, what to listen to, what references to pull from, you check out hidden.ny on Instagram because that is the real place where the real OGs go to, a place where some guy just goes and regurgitates images that are already available on the internet and reshares them again like they're original and then tries to act like he knows anything where he doesn't know anything about zero and then to make it worse exploits his flipping customers and user base for designs and whatever and competitions and all this sort of nonsense and comes out with the most redundant boring milk toast mayonnaise type designs you've ever seen which is why i think in general it's one of the most offensive platforms on there if you wasn't noticing before i was being sarcastic about calling it great it's absolutely trash it's one of the most offensive platforms I, I exist because this is a good example of it this tweet from clayton chambers says as follows hidden ny the most hype worthy account on instagram maybe is um what would you say little jupiter is he next or is he before little jupiter is pretty followed in it um but anyway it continues 
the most hype worthy account on Instagram, just launched a pop up shop in Soho. He collabed with Shopify and the Blue Bottle Roast on the space. Good moves from Shopify lately, especially after they powered Nigo's pop up space recently, too. So, I guess somebody who's involved in a culture is involved in Shopify and is now spearheading this introduction into the streetwear, menswear, fashion you know cultural stuff whatever space that they're trying to occupy in similar to the stuff that i did when i was at mastered when i was a person who's responsible for getting all of those mentors co-mentors who helped to run the online streetwear program that was headed by none other than virgil Abloh, r.i.p the go i was responsible for getting all those people involved there from the samuel rosses to the um fraser cooks to the whatever you named them i was in i was involved in naming every single person that was on that list and all it takes is one person that's it it just takes one person to be in the organization to suddenly get different people in there and to kind of change how people view the course how people view the company view the service and this is what that person is doing behind the scenes it's just a well, it's shopify it's just a shame that it chose flipping hidden ny a place that features some of the best the best the best streetwear you know material you know or flipping um media that exists out there but then is unsourceless because oh it's lacking in source right unsourceless is um flipping what you call it it's hot sauce mixed with water diluted to shit because you would never imagine a place a, a profile that shares so many cool images could come up with something so dead and lacking in inspiration there's like a derelict building i guess that's been painted white with a stencil of hidden and why on the top right hand corner and then inside, there's the standard boring things that they have in there. A couple of skateboard decks hanged up on the wall. Cool. What's the context? We don't know. Guys wearing t-shirts. Cool. What's the context? We don't know. And then um, next on the fixtures, they've got TV stacked around each other. Have we never seen that before? Is that new? Of course it isn't. It's boring. It's tired. It's old. Then they've got the terrible needles collaborations there with a the jacket on some sort of on some sort of rack thing with a hidden H there. A couple of H's all over the place. Bare walls, crazy racks, random crates with what magazines and stuff that he's probably copied and ripped stuff on to put in his Instagram account. It's just devoid of any sort of real source or oomph. There's nothing really that makes it interesting in the slightest. And that's what I think is the really disappointing part about that platform all that good stuff that you feature all that interesting stuff that you feature but you can tell it doesn't come from a real place because when he's asked to do his own thing and hey present a space showcase um show us what your world is about give us an your introduction into the kind of things that inspire you and what you're into this is the best he can come up with a pop-up space should be a space where you should really go crazy because it's a legitimate temporary space where you can go a bit nuts be a bit more conceptual and really take people on a journey showcase them your world it might not be something that you go on to do later on in life in terms of your own store or your own space but it's a good place to really kind of set the precedent or kind of give people an idea on where you're trying to go i think immediately of like what aaron bondroff used to do back in the day with the new york thing like the rec center all that sort of stuff like those things are just like e experiments or something that you run in real time that then go and form other things and then when he went and set up oh wow before he got kicked out of it um that was obviously a natural progression of all the stuff that he had done from you know from a new york thing onwards and this you imagine should be a good platform to maybe showcase that and maybe also you do this really well and you can maybe get the interest of other brands that see what you're doing they maybe see you've got an installation that is you know has some sort of correlation to this type of subject to be like oh my god this is something that we could be interested in. i don't know you could just think of things that are really far out there that really kind of influence your taste and your interest that could maybe be displayed in there that could make the experience a lot more interesting or maybe just offer better products and it could make it a way more fun a space what we have at the moment is just a redundant really tired and lacking in inspiration or source or anything space that just looks whatever you might also just put it up on shopify and let people buy online what's the point of getting the space when you're just going to serve me this dross and then what was playing on the flipping speakers probably some whatever trendy rapper that everyone's sucking a dick of now at the moment maybe sg maybe 42 doug whatever it may be and then you've got that and suddenly you think you've got a brand if you can go and experience and i think it's tired i think it's dead but it's good to see that Shopify have got someone involved who clearly knows what's going on because, you know, they said that they, you know, collaborated with Nigo, who's, you know, leaps and bounds better than what he would be doing here with this sort of stuff. But yeah, it's just a shame that they didn't really go and do anything better with that one. Who is actually the person at Shopify who's actually responsible for this? Let's see what the comments say. I have a good feeling Wex is behind all these Shopify moves. Oh, I guess because, oh yeah, true. He left Thing to go to Shopify, right? 
Um, the only leave added has to go Shopify. Is that true? Um, what the person say? Dang, didn't think of it that. No doubt. I will say as somebody who stood in line for entirely too long and pop up um, fell flat to me. See, told you. The main draws was the Solomon collab, which they used to get people in there, but didn't only have 10 total pairs spread over five, three days. You make Solomon. So somehow these guys got Solomon collab. I don't know how, I don't know why, you know, whatever, whatever. And then you get Solomon collab and then you don't get enough stock to fill up the space. You don't make it interesting. There's nothing in that space that shows you that they've got a, a shoot, a footwear collab. Nothing. Um, it just looks fucking devoid of anything. It's pretty shit. And then people leave that kind of review. Of course. I'm not surprised. Another tweet says 10 pairs. Yep. I wasn't happy. And now Hidden are collaborating with Solomon. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. V loan for hipsters. Great, great um thing that someone said here. That's basically what hidden is. It's V loan for fucking hipsters, isn't it? That's what it is really. V loan for fucking hipsters. But yeah, absolutely maddening, absolutely crap, absolutely shit. Not really in it at all. So that can get got. Next, we have a clip courtesy of a DJ called Pinera E46. And this is concerning my favorite female dj out there on the circuit my favorite woman dj my favorite dj overall chippy non-stop remember her i featured her on the podcast some time ago when she did a live stream i think for mix mag that was trida dash in general it's not a bad thing we all have crappy mixes i have a few of them on my own channel but you know call a spade a spade i thought the mix was pretty shit um, and then I think I also spoke about it because she said some wild stuff on Twitter about people and going to Berlin and male DJs and all this sort of nonsense stuff. And what the conclusion that I came away from it was that most likely this lady is a troll, is a shit poster, which has worked really well for her because she's got a really amazing little DJ career going on. I see her in flyers and playing in different places all the time. So congratulations. Well done. But. When you are a troll and you're shit stirrer, sometimes if you go too far, you end up alienating everyone. And now she's at a point where she generally might be the only person who I can think of in culture, in arts, or whatever you may be called, whatever you call this scene, who is a minority background person, somebody who's from a place that isn't Europe or whatever, so, you know, you've got that thing going on for you, plays the music that she plays and looks the way that she does, but also is hated by guys and girls equally. <laughs> ridiculous like just because she's annoying you know what i mean like must be the only person in legitimate that i've seen who's able to do such a thing who's able to annoy both sexes so easily just through her mere presence and just who she is as a, as a human being which is hilarious i think in general but i also think her presence is necessary i'm gonna be honest i know this is annoying and people don't like it and they're gonna make comments and stuff but i think her presence is absolutely necessary so let's continue this DJ called Panera E46, I think, I guess, was playing on the same lineup as Chippy Nonstop. They get into some passa passa that DJs get into about who's coming on next, what time are you playing, you're playing too fast, you're playing too slow. Nonsense DJ stuff that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. You're still both getting paid an exorbitant amount of money to play people's music that isn't yours, to play other people's music, sorry, and just press Q and play. It's a privilege to have that job. It's an absolutely honor to have that job. And the fact that you have it, you should not be taking it for granted and wasting your time arguing about such nonsense things. But again, these are going to DJ. These are going to complain. It is what it is. So um, this um, Instagram uh, compilation that this person put together basically describes the nature of what happened. So first of all, we've got a clip uh, playing here. Let's play the clip. Is there a clip? It is a clip, right? Is it going? No, no it's got here. First of all, it's a clip. So we go to the next page. So yeah, first of all, we see of the first clip, we see a picture of the mixer with everything up, all the channels, which is insane, right? This is pure, insane behavior. This is like, equivalent to like um that viral video of black madonna or now known as the blessed madonna who's slipping you know pulling the flipping uh, mixer from side to side as she's trying to crossfade the tunes in out in out you know from one side to the other um but this is worse because this is, means all four channels are up which means she's either jeff mills reincarnated or she forgot what channel is what channel and stuff's just on or whatever. I don't know. But I would love to hear what that must have sounded like. So all four channels are up. Next slide. We have some rare infield action of Chippy nonstop doing the damn thing, pressing the knobs, flicking the wrist and, you know, being the superstar DJ that she is. And obviously, as you can tell, even to the untrained ear, it's clanging, it's terrible. 
um, it just sounds like a complete mess, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> Big up Chippy. Some girl screaming in the background because there's just a girl playing on behind the decks. No acknowledgement of flipping whether or not it's good or not. She's just, yay, slay girl, clanging all over the place. It sounds like pots and pans. You know, it sounds like a flipping, um, a moose ran through flipping Gord Gordon Ramsay's kitchen or something, but who cares? Slay. Jesus Christ, Chippy. Okay, better. Something's gone out. Okay, so you 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 get the vibes, right? It was it was a bit of an up and down experience, but we've got some video proof of what has actually happened in the event. Then the next slide, you've got a tweet from Chippy Nonstop, who's now verified on Twitter for whatever reason. I mean, she's living a life, but she's won. She won. She won. Mediocre DJ skills, um, expert level trolling and shit posting skills, and the ability to get verified and to go boo all the way to the moon. Big up Chippy Nonstop, man. The best DJ in the world. It continues. I hate DJing with techno men. <laughs> what did we do? We didn't tell you to put all the channels up. Hey, anyway. This guy wouldn't let me play my set and it was at 3.30. I went on at 3.50. Then I heard him talking to the DJ before him saying, being like, why did you end your set at 1.50 BPM? Baby, you're a professional. Figure it out. <laughs> Imagine if a man said that to her. Figure it out. Or let me show you. <laughs> man spending. Imagine that. Imagine. Hilarious, right? I never understood this whole thing about, oh, when you end your set, well, who cares, 150? I guess it's a European, it's not even a European thing, it's a UK thing. No, UK people don't really care about that. Maybe it's a European thing, actually, I think about it. It's a European thing where, like, if one person's playing a two-hour set and you're meant to be playing after them, there's usually this understanding between DJs that you're going to, like, give the person a great way to kind of start their set so you end it by kind of lowering the pace and slowing it down so that they have a chance to start their set. But the best clubs I've been to, the best place people I've heard play, what they do is that you just play your set, hour or two hours, and then when it's your last tune, you just lower the song, and the other person makes it known, yeah, give this guy a round or girl a round of applause. That was sick. Everyone rounds applause, da -da -da -da, the, the tune gets lowered, and then the other person just starts. They don't attempt to mix in the other track. That's something that we do a lot here in the UK, where you come on next and you're mixing into the other track. No, you don't need to mix in. Let the person have their moment. They play their set. Let them get the acknowledgement and the love. And then you can start clean. And I, I prefer doing that myself. I prefer kind of starting off very slow. I put on something that's like 82 BPM just to kind of, you know, um, what you call it? Just to give the dance floor a bit of a rinse. Let people go off and get drinks. Go in the toilets, do a bump. Have a piss, have a shit. And then as I ramp up again, people can come back in and decide whether they want to stay or not. But this whole idea of like, oh, it has to be like, well, what the, what tempo I'm playing is just some weird thing. I don't know why people have that weird hang up. Anyway, next slide. Uh, Panera then responds. Saw that tweet said, yeah, you didn't mention my name, but I'm going to put, put a flipping name on it. He says, are you joking? You did the same thing weeks ago. We in the lineup on the party in Warkal. Intentionally, we didn't use the word playing because that's not what you were been doing there. Oh. When we walked at the DJ booth, you've got three channels up. Every DJ with different. So clearly, you know, I don't know what accent I'm going for there, but you know what I'm doing. Uh, with different BPM. Knobs on the right. It sounded like shit with one spell. You kept clicking chaotically on all the buttons, all the DJs, on all the CDJs. And the best part, you were changing EQ on the channel, which was empty. You know what's hilarious about this? What I like about Chippy? She's just living her life trying to mix tunes. And this guy is seething in the background. Don't get me wrong. If it sounds like a nightmare, it sounds like a nightmare. But the fact that it could annoy you to this level is like, why would you care? If she's sinking out there and actually playing shit, wouldn't it make you look better because you actually played well? If you're going to go after her, you're going to sound amazing. Just let her do her thing in it. But it's a, it's an image of him just in the background. like, you know what I mean, if this was in my country, I would kill you. You know, <laughs> it's just like, it's just hilarious. Anyway, it continues. Sound system limiter was peaking at the time, which is the reason why on okay she's continuing with the tweet oh, that's why i took a picture of the limiter he sounds like a bit of a knock though isn't it? take a picture of the limiter you're going over the limit put the, the noise down it's like relax bruv you know what i mean if you don't run the club chill um which ironically looks exactly like the behavior of a shitty techno bro dj oh he's basically saying there are no gender wars here man you're just a prick 
Oh, ho, ho. it continues. You are totally disrespectful, drunk as fuck, <laughs> and still pouring booze into yourself. That's a brutal insult. Not even pouring or not even drinking. You're pouring booze into yourself. Like she was just there downing, taking a bottle of Jameson's to the face. Jaeger master to the face. Bex. No, she was like a beer girl. She was like she drinks pints. You know what I mean? Cronenberg to the face. She's like holding the bottom of the glass. Like, oh, oh. Mad girl. You ended 25 minutes after you should have. <laughs> Start late, end late, innit? Fuck it. Let's go, Chippy. Only because one person from the club crew turned you off and took you off. Wow. How embarrassing is that being in a nightclub? Someone has to turn your flipping system off in order to get you off to stop playing. Yikes. There must be bad stuff that happens on like the... I'm not too sure this was a major market. Maybe this was like a... Maybe this was in Poland. I'm not really too sure. That is Poland, isn't it? Walker, wherever that, that place was, he said. I'm, I, I assume it was Poland. I bet there must be some mad stories, isn't it, in those smaller regions um, where maybe, you know, no one's going to share an Instagram video of you playing in some random club in Hungary, in Romania, in Poland or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? Whereas they're going to share always images of you playing in Amsterdam, in Paris, in Berlin and whatnot. So there must be some really funny stories about people I'd love to find out about those people, man. Like, you know, you go to some of those bars and you'd hug some of how was so-and-so, and they might have some really interesting stories to tell you, for sure. It continues. The dance floor could only hear low EQ, low FQ, sorry. In the whole venue, there was an overwhelming wall of bass. <laughs> this was, this sounds like, um, what's his face? This sounds like a DJ set from, um, what's his flipping name, man? What's her name? What's the Asian lady's name that was married to the guy from the Beatles? That sounds like a she DJ. That's what it sounds. I mean, her just screaming to the mic. Like, ah! <laughs> it continues. It was uncomfortable for people who attended this party and they left during your set, quote unquote. But this biggest problem is not your lack of skills. Oh, Panera with the dunks. It is your behavior. USB stick. You were wasted. You 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 were so wasted that you almost fell down. <laughs> I love her, bro. Rock star shit. Chippy nonstop is a rock star, man. We don't play around here. We go to DJ in smaller markets and we pour cheap beer down our throats. We get ligged up on ket, coke, whatever else we can get up our nostrils. We play with four channels up, even though we're only using two. <laughs> we peak everything. Everything's at red. Rago turn 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 the flipping um turn the turn the limiter or whatever up to up to red on everything and let's roll. You took some drugs, drank more, passed out, drank more, and a few times attacked us <laughs> during our time putting your USB over and over until one of us told you to get the fuck out. She beat up these boys behind the decks. She pissed them off because she was mixing dodgy. Bruv, this woman's a ledge. Absolute <laughs> ledge. <laughs> Disaster, but I love it. This is the energy that we need, man. Enough of all this, like, I want to compete with the men. I want to do this this way. They don't let me. No, come in like a wrecking ball. Both, you know, physically and metaphorically, she's coming in like a wrecking ball. Let's do this, man. Get out the way. Elbows and baps. Elbows and baps. It continues. We didn't want to publish it. At first, we <laughs> thought that it was... Bruv, she's not fucking... Ricardo Villalobos or you know whatever like relax man just publish it it's no big deal they thought they were going to get cancelled for airing out their grievance with, with Trippy nonstop. it says more about these guys than her innit but anyway um, at first we thought that it was this sometimes happening to anyone it's business full of temptations but then we heard okay so they thought it was a one off but then they heard from other people bad mouthing her that she gets on it all the time <laughs> <laughs> but it's a business full of temptation he says but then we heard that this is not the first time you're acting like this still we chose not to publish it but this is just too much <laughs> that one tweet set them up honestly she's got a way of pressing people's buttons she just said i hate playing with techno bros made some vague insults here and there but it wasn't anything crazy and it still touched him so clearly this lady has the ability to really get on people's skin clearly we're going to upload a video from your spectacular show on our Instagram. Take care, practice more, and stop being such a hateful person. By the way, we asked someone from Warsaw for an explanation of what happened yesterday, and it wasn't the male DJ who was responsible for the delay. Oh, the male and female wars in DJ continue. It's proper G-A-Y in like the proper sense of G-A-Y. It's lame. It's awful. It makes no sense. 
just share the dance floor together, share the booths together. If someone's playing a fast set before you, it doesn't matter. Just flipping, lower the flipping channel and then let them have their moment, let them have their claps and then you start playing whatever you want to play, whether it's 86 BPM or 120. It doesn't actually matter. And if the person before you is getting lick, liquored up and they're peaking and doing whatever, don't be a knock. Don't start recording them and showing that they're peaking the limiter and they've got all the channels up. Who cares? Maybe share it with your friends in a group chat and stuff, but it's not something to kind of you know hit some over the head with someone's terrible and not taking a job seriously it just is what it is the whole flipping industry or genre occupation is full of chances and people who just got there because of whatever reason they got there it's not a serious occupation is it there's some people that take it seriously don't get me wrong but it's not exactly like um rocket science to be able to dj and some people can do it liquored up and ketted up and coked up and mdma up and shroomed up and weed up and whatever else let them do as they please if they have a horrible set and they clang all over the place it makes for a better story for you to tell your friends and also it gives you an opportunity to come in and fucking sound like dj harvey because if you just play a semi-decent set you're gonna sound amazing you're gonna sound like ben ufo compared to them if they're there clanging all the channels up not no, no idea where they are playing the same tune twice um Port, you know queuing and stopping the wrong track thinking it's another track like that's all in your favor mate it's not really that big of a deal in my opinion i don't necessarily think so but clearly my guy panera was not having it but yeah big up chippy non-stop for rattling everybody all the time absolute legend one of the greatest djs out there in the industry i don't care i don't care <laughs> i love it man funny how she does this so easily with such with such with such ease with such panache it happens you know with a flick of the wrist, some would say. With a flick of the absolute wrist. So, next, we have to move on to this news, courtesy of Hypebeast, regarding the Travis Scott Jordan 1 lows that are meant to be coming out, the reverse mochas. It's interesting, right? Because I remember saying in my head, as a joke, that the, that the what you call it, um, that no one, no, I tweet, I think I might say, I don't know if I tweet it, I'll tell you my head, but basically I was saying that with all these announcements that the Travis Scott shoes are now coming back out, it seems like the brands don't necessarily care about dead kids anymore. The whole thing that everyone was doing where they were trying to feign flipping sympathy and, you know, feelings for people that died in the flipping Asher World tragedy and people were trying to hold Nike accountable and saying that they can't drop these shoes because Travis was responsible because of how reckless he was and him saying, I don't care, let's rage and all this sort of stuff that looked really terrible, blah, 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 blah. blah. But when it comes down to it, they do they don't really care. Do you know what I mean? The shoes are still dropping. There's still a full marketing campaign going behind them. There's videos I've seen online. You know, Travis is promoting on his on his social media platforms. People are hyped for them. They're selling out in seconds. Even the Air Trainer ones that are absolutely awful. Like, and I'm a big fan of Air Trainer ones. I think it's one of, again, one of my favorite Nike models, a model designed by the legendary sneaker designer Tinker Hatfield. But these are terrible in my opinion, especially the little sock thing that goes over them. But people are absolutely wetting themselves over getting a pair of them, getting a pair of the, getting something from the apparel collection, which looks fairly decent. But again, it's just funny, isn't it? People's morals and people's principles or the way people feel about certain things is really uh, precipitated by how much time happens in between. Does, does life move on? Does things change? And things have changed so far to the point where people have maybe forgotten about the deaths of those children and moved on to other things. And maybe sometimes people have maybe with this time thought maybe rationally about it and be like you know what it actually wasn't his fault i'm not really too sure but i just find it incredibly hilarious how one moment there were people advocating for nike to scrap these and bend them and now all of a sudden they're all coming up back to back to back to back to back and you know if you're a reseller and stuff you're going to be super happy to be able to get a pair but i think if you're a person that was online ranting and raving that travis was responsible for the death of those children and then you go out and buy a pair and wear them you got to look yourself in the mirror and be ashamed and be ashamed because I don't get it. Because is this really worth, you know, ignoring your morals, um, ignoring your ethics, ignoring your principles to wear these? Really? These shoes? They're fucking garbage, man. Really garbage. I'm not really too sure what is really the excitement level reasons to have these shoes on your possessions but maybe i'm in the minority here in terms of that i think most people would actually be stoked to have them um but i don't really get them the mocha ones reverse ones sorry i hate 
anything that's to do with a Jordan mid or to do with a Jordan low, I hate. Jordan one should only come in highs and highs alone. The lows look absolutely awful, especially when you see people wearing them in person. The only reason why these look good in the pictures is because the guy is wearing stacked denim that looks kind of flared. And it's also covered to the point where if you didn't see the heel tab, you'd think it was a Jordan high. So it kind of is, is a bit deceptive. But as a model, they look awful. They look like you're just trying to save material. It looks like a cheaper version they don't they look too pointy when they're lows too i don't know why the front of the toe box ends up looking way more pointed than what it looks like when it's a mid when it's a high the mids already look awful the mids look a little bit redacted but at least with the mids you still have that shape with the sh of the jordan one you should have that great silhouette but with the dunk sorry with the jordan one lows they just look like horrible version of dunk lows which i think are also awful the only dunks you should be wearing are dunk highs but at least dunk lows have like a bit more like not say girth's a good way to say it girth instead of saying not saying a pause but they're a bit more girthy at dunk low they spread out across the feet a little bit better the toe box looks nicer they drop better with jeans and shit whereas the dunk the jordan one lows just look absolutely garbage in my personal opinion but the funny thing is the release the release version ones look like this and i think the ones that travis scott was pictured wearing courtside one time with little baby they had a black swoosh if i'm not mistaken maybe it was black maybe it was dark brown but i'm pretty sure the swoosh wasn't this kind of off-white kind of creamy colorway that he's got but the color palette he uses for his trainers i think is fairly interesting in terms of an artistic creative point of view um because there's clearly a a specific palette that he likes in terms of the different brown hues and the creams and the off-white those are really nice earthy colors so i do like that and there's a definitely a story that's been told throughout every single one of his collaborations that he's done with nike um going for going from the first one all the way to the ones that he's doing now but the only really kind of standout ones that kind of look a bit terrible now in hindsight are the air force ones that he put out but that, that might be because that was at a time where he hadn't earned enough kind of clout tokens or you know enough sort of ratings within in like to be allowed to go and actually apply his mindset creativity his point of view his codes onto a model from the way up from the ground up because obviously they've let him this redesign the air trainer one all over you know it's covered in looks like is it nylon or something nylon corduroy it looks like um over there it all looks like it's been like reverse stitched as well um there's zips on it you know what i mean um there's metal eyelets on the eye stays like really different changes that they've made all over a shoe that usually isn't like this do you know what i mean so clearly he's earned a quick clack tokens in that way but i think this all tells a better story than the air force one stuff i think that was obviously maybe the weakest stuff that he maybe put out but um yeah man i don't really get it i really don't um even the MX ones that are due to come out, here's just pictures from unreleased ones, which somebody's already got a, a few pairs of that they're going to be worth a lot of money in resale. Um, the MX ones I think were really terrible. These kind of reverse swoosh ones with this sort of like ACG outdoorish type thing going on, I'm not really a fan of. But I do like the application and the colorways that go into them because they all again tell a unified story. They kind of represent the brand really well, and um, yeah this is just a it's just an easy relationship for nike to have in it get someone that's easy in terms of brand friendly you know before the astro world thing and um somebody that clearly all the kids love and people think you know has some sort of style point so people are going to want to wear it because they want to look like him um cool if anything the air trainer ones maybe look better on the side profile if i'm if i'm not being if i'm gonna be honest like that blue looks pretty nice on the side profile like that but then when they're pictured like this they look pretty shit. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't take it takes doesn't take much, but that's probably the reason why I wouldn't be that much of a fan of it. So I think it's a mixture of like corduroy as well, isn't it? Is that corduroy there? It looks in the background there. Interesting material choices. I'm not sure what that is here on the on the heel tab. But yeah, I'm not really a fan of them. Don't care. Uh, it's just funny to see people kind of creeping themselves over these shoes, considering everyone was had such a hard time dealing with the fact that loads of children passed away at that festival, Astro World, but now everyone doesn't seem to care interesting interesting um i think that might be it for now isn't it? i think that might be it i think so anything else to check yeah i think that might be it for now so i'm gonna leave it for now another show coming up as well we're gonna have, probably do a double you know why not on the same day but for now thank you so much for tuning into the action single show episode number five seven eight it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're watching it via YouTube and listening via the audio podcast, please leave me a review. That'd be greatly appreciated. If you are, yeah, that's it. And if you want to subscribe to the Patreon, you could also do that too. The link is in the description. Click it, patreon.com, watch us Agostino. You can 
you know, see all that good stuff over there. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care. Be safe. Hasta la vista.